right. Um, let me pull up my notes. We sent out a survey to some of our clients and asked a bunch of our staff as well. And I'm going to pull that up so I have it available. Um, and we'll get responses. Okay. Um, Cool. Well, welcome everybody. My name is Winston Parsons, Community Engagement Specialist at the Richmond Senior Center. I'm here today sponsoring another in our Meet the Candidate series. Uh, we're joined by Veronica Shinzato, candidate for Richmond District Supervisor. And Veronica, sort of the format we're thinking, I think I described this in our correspondence, is you can present sort of your yourself and your campaign and what issues you, you want to talk about. And then we have some questions that I have in advance, and then we can ask folks like Cheryl and anybody else who joins what, what's on their mind as well. How does that sound? Absolutely, that sounds wonderful. All right, well, uh, by all means, tell us about you. Well, again, thank you very much for inviting me today. Um, I, my name is Veronica Shinzato, and I immigrated to San Francisco back in the 80s. My family immigrated from Okinawa to Peru and Peru to here to San Francisco. My father was actually came as one of the Peruvian, one of the first Peruvian chefs at Alejandro's restaurant on 18th and Clement. That's no longer here, but it was the first in California. And that's how my family ended up coming to San Francisco. You know, I grew up here in the Richmond district and I'm currently raising my two boys here. I have a 21 year old son who graduated from George Washington High School, attended City College, and would now be going to UCLA. I also have a 10-year-old son who attends Lafayette, um, who has a pre-existing condition and also um, a learning disability. So I understand the challenges right now parents are having with, you know, learning at home, trying to work, while trying, you know, the regular concern of paying rent and bills um, on a day-to-day. -day. You know, in regards to why I'm running for office, I have, 20 plus years of public service. I've worked in both the local and state government. I've worked at the Board of Supervisors in the 90s, where I helped to establish the first bike lanes here in San Francisco, the Valentin bike lanes. I worked at the State Assembly under Carol Migden, where I was able to work on LGBTQ issues and senior issues and really work to, um, on issues of environment. One of the biggest ones was to make sure, you know, we decrease cars by 2020, now it's being moved to 2035. And these are issues that back when I worked in the 90s and in the early 2000s, it was considered progressive, ridiculous, hard to implement. And these are now issues that we're talking about day to day. And I've had the privilege of really working with electors that had a lot of foresight. So this is why I'm ready. The reality is I'm a small business owner here in San Francisco. And I understand the struggles of so many small businesses. Like mine, I had to close because of COVID-19. I currently live with my two um, senior parents here in the Richmond district. I'm here in their old, you know, typical San Francisco Richmond kitchen. Um, and I understand the struggles of our senior community. I just had a discussion with Winston that, you know, most homes here don't have air conditioning because of our electrical system doesn't allow for it. So how do we make sure that our senior population can age in place, age in home like my parents? Well, the truth is we need leadership at the board. who are really gonna start addressing the issues and it really becomes issue by issue. I understand we have a large homelessness issue, an unhoused population issue, affordable housing issue, but how do we take care of our immediate concerns, which is making sure that our children are safe and our seniors are safe. My priority at the Board of Supervisors, one, is economic recovery. We have to start by making sure that we build a post-COVID economy that works for all families and struggling businesses and making sure our most vulnerable population, like our senior population and children, are not left behind. Two, we have to crack down on property and hate crime. People don't want to talk about it, but the truth is here in the Richmond district, we have a large percentage, a large increase of hate crime in our community. My own mother was a victim of this, and I understand it does happen. So we need to start making sure that when it is reported, that we have language accessibility to report these issues and the support in our community of our seniors to be able to report this and, you know, have the services to recover from it, not just economically, but emotionally and spiritually. Second of all, we need to make sure that Muni is safe and reliable, especially during COVID-19 when a lot of our seniors depend on Muni, we have to make sure our Muni lines work. The truth is right now, Muni takes a long time 
and it's currently not following, you know, social distancing requirement, making it our senior population vulnerable to COVID-19 and other issues like the flu, we're entering the flu season. So the truth is there's a lot of work for our, us as the members of the Board of Supervisors to address. One of my biggest proposals right now is to really work with the Mayor's Office of Housing. We have money in our housing to build housing, but we don't have enough to complete the project. And what that means is the city has money to buy property, but not to build it out for affordable housing or vice versa. So my goal is right now, since we're trying to recover and keeping people safe, is we use that money for what's called mid-density, making sure proper single property owners, single housing, we change the zoning so we can build granny units. So that you, instead of, you know, you see individual homes here in San Francisco, there are two or three units added in one single plot. Two is making sure that the mayor's office of housing provides grants for our seniors to age in place and for the middle class working families that so that they can grant so that their families can grow in place instead of moving out. You know, I've always said how we treat our seniors says a lot about our values. And we, our values right now are not spoken well of how we treat our seniors. Right now, we, we haven't discussed this in many forums, but I know this from personal experience from my parents and other seniors that I've been helping out. There is a lot of seniors that feel isolated and depressed who have not left their homes because of COVID-19. And, you know, and it, it really takes a village to make sure our senior population are safe. So I wanna thank the Richmond Senior Center and the Community Center for stepping up. It cannot be easy to do this kind of work. It's the work that very few people acknowledge because we assume it just happens, but it doesn't. It takes a lot of courage to be able to work day to day with our senior population. And it's a population that if we don't take care of, I keep saying, we are in a lot of hurt because we depend on our senior population, one, because they're our number one volunteers in nonprofits. They're our number one volunteers when it comes to community service. Two, they make sure our economic moves forward because they're the number one child providers of children, of, for their grandchildren, nieces, nephews, and neighbors. If we do not make sure our seniors are safe in our community, we will lose them as child providers. And what does that mean? That means mom and dad will have to either decide to stay home or quit their job. So when we look at seniors, we gotta make sure we look at them not just as a vulnerable population, but as a population that contributes so much to our economy and our community. So I can tell you that as a person who lives with two seniors here in, San, in the Richmond district, as a supervisor or just as your neighbor, you have my support. Thank you. Thanks, Veronica. Um, let me pull up our, my notes here from some of our survey. Uh, just a moment, inadvertently close the tab. Okay, so the first um, prompt for you is, uh, can you share some of your core values? What are the most important values that drive um, you overall? Because I think we could sit here and talk all day about specific issues, but part of um, electing a representative is having the trust to know that they have your values at heart, right? And that you, you can't know what they're, how they're gonna act on every issue. Um, so how, what are your core values and how would you work with colleagues on the board that you might disagree with? Well, absolutely. I think values has, says a lot about a candidate. My values is one, I am the oldest of three children. And as Americanized as I, our family is, um, you know, I graduated from public school and I got my master's degree at um, USF. I'm at home with my two parents taking care of them. And our values here at home is, you know, family first. And that's what the values I will bring at the board, family first. And I will treat the Richmond residents, our voters, San Francisco's as family. And I will fight for them like I do for my own parents and my own children. You know, I can definitely tell you it's not easy um, living with your parents again after being, um, you know, away and in college and doing all those great things. But it's a responsibility I think I have um, with my parents to make sure that they age happy, if anything, and that they age safely. 
Um, and so that is something I'll bring at the board is that the priority is to make sure that even though we disagree, and I think there's going to be more disagreement than agreement, that there's common ground that it, when it comes to particularly San Francisco and our residents, we want to make sure everyone's thriving and everyone's safe during that time, especially post COVID-19 where we actually don't know what's going to happen. So I think while there are disagreements on what the process will be to get there, I think there will be an agreement that you know, we want what's best for our residents of San Francisco. And that would always be my argument that I can disagree on the process and I can compromise, but the goal always has to be the residents of San Francisco. Got it. Okay. Um, you started touching on this, I think a little bit um, about, you know, post COVID, but if you were elected supervisor, um, what is your plan or vision for San Francisco's COVID-19 response in 2021? What, what, and what from your, you know, familiarity is the city planning on doing well and what, what gaps do you see? Well, right now, I think, first of all, please, everyone wear a mask, you know, wash your hands, continue to do that. I really don't think California, even in San Francisco, is done with the first wave and we can expect the second wave. Um, as winter approaches and as the flu season. So please get your flu shots. And we all have to maintain, you know, social distancing, you know, wearing a mask, um, washing our hands and hand sanitizers. That's one thing we can, need to continue to do. Come, you know, post COVID, my priority is economic recovery. Because if we don't start focusing on supporting our small businesses, we lose tax revenue. If we lose tax revenue, the city doesn't have any income to be able to do the things that they've promised, which is, you know, provide affordable housing, taking care of our unhoused, all their social services program. So we have to make sure that the city has revenue to do this. What that includes is helping our renters who, you know, a lot of them, including members of my family, have not been able to find a job since April and have lived on unemployment. So how do we get those individuals back to work? Well, that's again, by supporting small businesses and creating new programs, hopefully at City College of San Francisco and then lose their accreditation, of making sure they're trained for new green jobs that hopefully will come as 21 and 22. You know, I do believe in forgiveness of rent, but we also have to start talking to the banks about forgiving mortgages because property owners like my family have worked really hard, like many of you worked really hard to buy property in the city. And the property income that comes in from rental is their income. And if they lose that, you're gonna see a lot of foreclosures of small property owners. And that's also a large members of our senior population. So we gotta make sure that you know we forgive rent, we also make sure the federal government or our banks here in California forgive mortgages so that we don't have a huge, huge wave of people leaving. Three, oh, here's my son, come, come in. <laughs> Sorry. Three is, you know, with COVID, how do we move forward? I do not agree that we should start moving out our unhoused population out of hotels. I know that's something that the mayor is working on with the Board of Supervisors, and that's something they're starting to implement. I do not believe, even though it's a really nice weather right now, winter is coming. The flu season is coming. And I truly believe that as long as we can afford to keep these unhoused population in the hotels, it will be safer for our community. So I think we need a better plan of how we're going to treat our unhoused population moving forward. And that needs to start now, because if we just get our unhoused population back on the streets, that means we're going to have a lot more tent villages than we did three months ago. And that's not healthy for any member of the community or our unhoused community. So that's one thing I think the city has to do better in planning. And we have to start looking at making sure that we keep correct data, not only of those who are unhoused, but also those who are on the verge of becoming unhoused. There are a lot of people right now living in their cars. There are a lot of people right now living couch to couch. We need to count those individuals as unhoused so we get the appropriate state and federal funding. Moving forward, you know, public safety has always been one of my biggest concerns here in this district is we have to 
build on the power of the district attorney and city attorney to investigate and prosecute these bad actors. San Francisco has always had this idea that if you commit a crime here, you know you have a better chance of getting away with it than if you did it in Contra Costa County, Marin County, or even in San Mateo County. We need to change that perception. If you come to San Francisco and commit a crime, particularly a crime against our senior population, you will be prosecuted. You will be held accountable for your actions. Those actions and accountability might mean mental health services or might mean that you really need to be taught a lesson. Whatever that is, we have to hold these bad actors accountable. And you know, so post COVID-19, I think um, I told a lot of my candidates, it is one of the hardest time to run for office. I don't know why, including myself, why you wanna be in this hot seat knowing that we're in a deficit, knowing that hard decisions are going to be made, knowing that um, you're probably not gonna be very much light because you're gonna have to cut more than create. But the reality is this is why we're running because we know we're qualified to do the job. I know that my experience as a business owner and my experience of working 15 plus year in a tax agency where I've learned about tax revenue and the complications of you know, how that affects local government, I have a great advantage of my um, opponents to really bring in budget common sense into the Board of Supervisors. Thank you. Um, very thorough reply. Uh, I appreciate that. It's kind of a, a very big question too, and it's hard to encapsulate. What is your vision for the dealing with the next unforeseeable consequences of a once in a century pandemic and the economic fallout? So I appreciate the uh, the gravity of that question. Um, the other obvious question for our demographic um, and community is around disability and aging services. Um, there is a quarterly meeting of the Richmond Community Coalition, which I pretty sure you're familiar with. And then we have part of my job has been to facilitate a monthly meeting of the Richmond Senior Roundtable, which are agencies that serve seniors, adults with disabilities in the neighborhood. Um, what would you view your relationship to be if you were elected supervisors with those entities? And what would be your vision going forward for partnering with community based organizations? I've actually had um, several conversations with my team, you know, if I'm fortunate enough um, to get elected to the board, what I would change at the board and how I would change running my seat at the board. I worked at the board in 1990 under Jose Medina and Lisa Bessero when it was citywide elections. And it was run, you know, board member was in the office, the constituents had to call and email if they ever wanted to get hold of the board member. I think it's still run like that in many offices, even though it's a district office, district elections. And I know I've called members of the board of supervisors and I get a voicemail. Well, I'm old school. I believe everyone who calls should have a live person answer the phone. So that's one. First, if you call someone who is breathing will answer the phone and take your message or have a conversation with you. That's one. Two, it's important that your elected official has a presence here in the Richmond district, meaning a district office here in the, in the district. If that means a corner of a coffee shop where members of our community can get a hold of us, that's what it means if we don't have the money to rent space, which we probably won't. But I know there's a lot of businesses, um, including where I'm currently my campaign office is, that they've given me the venue for free in order to be accessible to the voters. And I think a lot of property owners here want that connection, want that relationship. So how else would I change it? Two, I think it's important to me with all the groups, not just at their monthly meeting, but really create a community leadership group for the member of the board of supervisor. So sort of like consultants, you know, from every sector, every group, because that way we get more dialogue going. I don't believe as an elected, you sit and you wait for people to come to you. I think it's the responsibility of the elected to come and come out to the community, to talk to the community members. 
that's how I work when I worked at the board and that's how Carol Minton taught me to work when I worked in the assembly in the Senate. You go out to the community to ask the questions, not wait in your office. So that, those are two major changes I would hope to be able to make. And those are two easy changes. So it's not just working with those particular group, which I think is extremely important, but with every group here in the Richmond district. Because as we know, the supervisor are elected by district, but they serve the decisions affect everyone in San Francisco. So you need, you know, to get a rounded experience. And as a member of the board, you can't be expected to know everything, but you should be expected to be open-minded to everyone's opinion. All right. Then the next uh, question or follow-up on that. Um, disability and aging services themselves. So what uh, funding policies um, and efforts would be priorities for you uh, to make aging in the Richmond uh, more dignified and possible? I think I touched that in the beginning of my opening. I think, you know, we have a large aging population here in the Richmond district and we have a large disability community here in the Richmond district. People you know, don't want to talk about it and don't think there is, but there is. And so what do we have to do? Well, the truth is we have to provide grants. The mayor's office of housing has funding. There is funding. There is also federal and state funding for this. It's a matter of making sure we bring it into our local government and it's used efficiently and transparently, which is very important. And what my hope is to provide these grants to our senior population so they can upgrade their homes, so they can age in place. I know my senior parents, my senior neighbors, Mr. Kim, they want to age in place. But the truth is the steps to go to their house are 20, 30 steps. So we have to make sure they're ADA compliant and they're ADA available for them to be able to safely get to their homes. You know, air conditioning, I think we talked about this briefly, air conditioning, something as simple as air conditioning, people can't just install in their homes. And this is not only for our senior and, and disabled community, but in general, because our electrical system, most homes here in the Richmond District electrical system is of the 1960s. It's not compatible with our current air conditioning system. So how do we make sure our senior population and our disability community, you know, can age and live comfortably and dignify as they should. Is for, first, we gotta make sure that we provide grants. And you have my commitment that I will push for this because I know every member of my block who are seniors have asked me about air conditioning, is making sure we provide grants so they can ADA their homes, so that they can live comfortably in their homes. That is key, especially during COVID and post COVID because the reality is I truly believe we're gonna be living in a social distancing world, you know, past 2020. And moving forward, we gotta make sure our senior and our disabled community stay safe and healthy. And if that's in their homes, then we need to provide them with the tools and resources that they can do that. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna check in with Cheryl actually, before I pepper you with some of the other questions that were sent to us. Cheryl, do you have any questions or issues you want to bring up for Veronica? Sure. Um, let's talk community. Um, so how do you feel the relations among the Rich Richmond District community members is? So do you feel there's unity, understanding, and mutual respect? Um, do you see that there's room for improvement? Um, and what's your idea of fostering that? Well, thank you for that question. I think one of the reasons why I, I, I live in the Richmond and um, even though I left to college and came back and I'm raising my children here in the Richmond is because it is a, a community, a small community within, you know, city and county San Francisco. The Richmond district, I think it's sort of like, you know, the suburbs of San Francisco. And it is a, one of the most, I keep saying, one of the most diverse community economically, racially, it really blends, it's a blended family of communities here in the Richmond. And I love that. You know, it's one of the most walkable places um, in San Francisco. Now, in regards particularly to organizations, 
and you know political clubs and everything else i think there is room for improvement i think everyone um has a role to play in the community everyone is fighting for resources everyone is fighting for funding um, to provide to provide either if it's for their senior population or disabled or children um, or different groups but i think there is room always room for improvement to collaborate i think the organizations and community organizations in the richmond do a good job compared to the rest of the city to collaborate together but I think as a member of the board, you have a responsibility to really, you know, foster a better relationship um, with each organization and foster collaborations where, you know, duplicate services might be uh, happening to better provide services to our community. So Ms. Mar, I think there's always opportunity to improve, but I also, as someone who's worked in a nonprofit, I worked for Mission Neighborhood Centers back in, oh my God, in the 90s kind of a long time ago. I know that each nonprofit um, has a goal and a responsibility to a specific part of our community, and I respect that, I really do. But I think as we collaborate, we just become better and stronger. So I think there's always room for improvement. I think as a member of the board, you have a responsibility um, to bring community together, organizations together to better serve our district. Thanks, Veronica. Um, let me look at our other questions. I think you touched on most of them. I'm gonna look at what some of our results were from people that responded. There were a couple of issues that came up, you know, one number one and two. Um, oh, this one hasn't been touched up on and as much. What, uh, what are the, some of the things that you think San Francisco, the city and county are doing well when it comes to healthcare, mental health services, um, and especially from the perspective of an adult with disabilities and someone who's aging, what are some of your priorities for San Francisco's healthcare and mental health services? Well, I think, you know, Healthy SF, I think that's, you know, has been a national um, example of what can work in the city and county. Um, Healthy SF has is, is done a great job, you know, making sure it's language accessible and accessible to everyone. What can we do better? I think we can always improve, but particularly here in the Richmond district, what I've seen is the lack of resources compared to other districts. And we've, while we have the resources at the city level, they don't always translate here in the west side of San Francisco, um, particularly here in the Richmond district. People tend to think that individuals that live in the Richmond district um, all own homes, which is not true, or all you know live well, and that's why it's you know we're so quiet. That is not true. There are a lot of low wage earners here. We have a lot of seniors and people with disability who live below the poverty level. So we need to make sure that the resources that are provided in the east side of San Francisco also translate here to the Richmond district, meaning we have to build affordable housing. There's a senior housing that's going to hopefully be built um, on Six and Gary, and that will be 100% affordable housing for our seniors. But that money didn't come from the local or state, that's federal funding. So we gotta make sure that we apply for all these fundings that are available at the federal level to build affordable or 100% if possible housing for our senior and disabled population. The one on Six and Gary will be one of the first developments here and I don't know how many centuries here in the Richmond district um, that's 100% affordable. But the Richmond district has to do a better job of doing its part of building affordable in 100% affordable housing, especially for a senior population if they can't age at home or if they choose not to, and for our disabled population to have better quality of life. So I mean, I think those are the priorities to making sure those resources that are available outside of the Richmond district come to the Richmond. You know, please um, correct me if I'm wrong, but we don't have a Richmond health clinic. There is, well, it's, there's NIMS. There's uh, NIMS, but. And there is a, it's a very, 
on California and 10th, yeah. there's a very like hole in the wall, um, SF health clinic or whatever, but it's, I think they only serve people who are uninsured. Correct. Yeah. So, you know, in the sunset, there's this, every district except for the Richmond has a healthy SF clinic. Um, we, no one wants to talk about it, but we need that here in the Richmond district as we have a growing large number of uninsured, a growing large number of seniors and people with disability who are going to become uninsured if they, you know, aren't qualified for Medicare yet. So, you know, the reality is those are one of the resources that we currently do not have here in the Richmond district that would serve the residents here better. Um, it would make a huge, I know we have, Kai, and everyone keeps telling me, well, Veronica, we have Kaiser. And I'm like, well, you have to be a Kaiser member to go to Kaiser. You, no one can just go there and be like, okay, I'm here. So, you know, I know many, many, many seniors that have to take the bus to the sunset to go to their, to get their medications because, you know, because of the health insurance issues. So the truth is we, we have to bring some of those resources. One of them is a clinic, a clinic that is open to everyone's. Got it. Thank you. Um, what else? We asked about aging uh, services. Um, I have one or two other potential questions, but maybe I'll see if anything. If there's anything else that Cheryl's thinking about. Um, sure, I can ask um, my other question about. Um, what you feel like you need to learn more about. So this can be either any sort of issue um, like in the political realm or in terms of populations. Um, but you know, it's really open to you. Like, well, you know, what, what do you need to learn more about? I think I need to learn more of everything. I love reading books and I believe as supervisor or as a human being in general, you never stop learning and like I tell my kids, I don't know nothing, so tell me what you think. And that is the approach I have taken, that I need to learn about every issue from the experts. You all are the experts when it comes to our senior population and our people with disability issues. So if I have an issue or I need to learn about, I'm going to go to you to learn more about the issues. One, um, I hope to think I, and well-rounded enough to talk about the issues. My strength, again, comes in finance, just because of the work I've been doing for the last 20 years is in finance. My master's in public admin is a specialty in finance. So those are my strength. Now, my weaknesses really comes down to the nitty and gritty. It's, you know, when it comes to our senior population, I live with my parents and I have experience of what I'm dealing with as seniors, but when it comes to our senior population, you know, I need to learn more about it, more about the day-to-day -day struggles, more about, you know, our low-income seniors and how, what they need, what they need and how do they expect for us to provide the services so that they can live comfortably here in San Francisco. I think I'll never stop learning or talking to individuals like yourself to teach me about the issues really affecting the day-to-day -day struggles of San Franciscans. And I think as a member of the board, we have to be open-minded enough to understand that we don't know everything. We don't, and but we are expected to understand it. And I am expected to be open-minded enough to understand how decisions made will affect not only the residents of the Richmond, but the entire city and county of San Francisco. Another issue that I will tell you that um, I can speak upon, but I definitely need to learn more about is our unhoused population. My focus on the unhoused population has always been on foster youth and ending the pipeline between foster youth and the homelessness. In the United States, 40% of people who've been in foster youth end up being homeless. I truly believe and I'm working on changing the, um, I'm supporting a bill that changes the law from 20, 21 to extend it to 25, giving our foster youth an opportunity to finish college while being housed. My hope is like we make small dents um, to end the pipeline between foster youth and the unhoused population 
so I'm well versed in that when it comes to our foster care and families that are homeless, but I'm not well versed at all when it comes to our unhoused population and drug addiction. Many of my poems have talked about a lot of our unhoused population that are on fentanyl and other substance. Those are issues that while I can speak on, I definitely don't have a clear understanding and I admit to that or a clear knowledge of how to help those individuals uh, move forward from being, you know, from their addictions to being housed and, you know, living a normal life. So I think those are opportunities for me to work with various groups to learn about more of the issues. But Ms. Mara, I can tell you, I've, you know, I've learned to accept that I don't know everything and I don't assume to know everything and I do want to learn about everything. So I'm open enough um, to hopefully be able to contact you or Mr. Winston to be like, hey, you know, this is the issue, you know, educate me on it. Perfect, thank you. Um, the one other question I'll, I'll bring up that um, I have in my notes here that comes up for a lot of our clients is uh, paratransit, specifically paratransit and taxis. Um, maybe you could share a little bit about um, your familiarity or with those systems and what you would want to see happen with them if you are um, elected supervisor. I actually have an uncle um, who had a stroke 10 years ago and he actually uses uh, the parent transit in the East Bay to come to San Francisco to visit my dad. And um, it's great because it allows him to, you know, commute without relying on family. But the issue becomes that I think they charge him like $10 a ride, which becomes $20. And that's not doable, affordable for our senior population and people with disability who live on, you know, fixed incomes. So moving forward, and I believe Parent Transit is, if I'm not mistaken, that's a private company. It is a, a trans dev has the contract currently through sure. SFMTA, so it's a private contract. Yeah, a private contract. Um, a my concern with that financed. private, yeah, publicly financed, but it's a it's a private company, so it's and it's not a nonprofit either. It's not a five one c three, if I remember correctly. That's correct. Um, my own my issue with that is the city spends a lot of money on this particular contract. But from what I've seen, um, the services provided aren't always as reliable as we think they are. And I've said this during my candidacy is one of the things that we need to do once we're at the Board of Supervisors because of the COVID-19 um, finances struggles that we're in is every contract we have in every department needs to get an audit. And we need to update our website at, city, at um, SFGov to make sure that every dollar that's spent, every tax dollar that's spent is accountable for. So that taxpayers like yourself understand where your money, how it came in and where it's going out. And be transparent. I know the state is moving towards this transparency to make sure that taxpayers understand, um, taxpayers are due information on how their money is spent by the city. So one is I think we need better accountability and transparency Regarding um, that particular contract, I'd like to see exactly how that contract is being implemented. We've had that contract, I believe, for quite a long time, um, in like 20 years, if I'm not mistaken. It's been, it was way before I joined the Board of Supervisors back in the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I, from what I've seen and heard from my seniors, neighbors is they don't get the best customer service for what the city is paying. Um, unfortunately, I've heard and, you know, of mistreatment, of lack of language accessibility, um, you know, lack of accountability when it comes to that population. And that's something that should never happen especially when these are city contracts paid by tax dollars. So I like to see a better relationship with this particular company and really come down to, first of all, they need to start hiring more people that look like members of the community 
and making sure that there's language accessibility and making sure that there are practices in place so that our seniors and our people with disability are treated with dignity and respect. That is my understanding right now. I think they do a good job right now at transporting our seniors, but there's always room for improvement. The other thing is I think their fleet is quite old, mm. needs a lot of repairs. Some of them actually don't have air conditioning. So it's a matter of making sure that, you know, if these are city tax dollars being spent on this, that they are comfortable for our seniors to ride. Um, as a member of the board, I think these services should, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, if they should be free to our seniors and people with disability. Yeah, I forget the exact pricing mechanism off the top of my head. It's Some of it's heavily subsidized, but paratransit and the taxi program are not free to right. users. Yeah, there's at least, they are at least cost the price of a, a muni ride. Muni ride. Each, each way. Each way, yes. Yeah, yeah. So you're talking about $6. Right which means a lot to a person with a fixed income. Um, and those are, and that's why I wanna see an audit because I can't imagine the city having this contract for so many years and for it to be, for our riders have to pay more than using Muni. Cause you can subsidize our, our seniors um, with a free Muni pass. So it doesn't come out to $3, right? But if they take parent transit, if they need it, it it's more expensive than sometimes, you know, an Uber. So those are things I think issues we need to address, um, especially post COVID. We need to look at these contracts and making sure that, you know, they're available for a senior population. And $3 per ride is not affordable. It needs to either be 100% free or extremely subsidized where it becomes what it, it was supposed to be. Because if I remember correctly, it was only supposed to be like a dollar. Um, which I haven't seen in a long time. And the only reason I know a little bit about this is because again, my uncle uses it, but they charge him, you know, $10 coming here and $10 back. So he can only do it once a month. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something regarding, you know, the cabs and the vouchers. Again, the city needs to do a better job of taking care of our senior population. How we treat our seniors and the people with disabilities says a lot about our values. And if we are going to treat our seniors with a dignity and respect, then we need to put our money where our mouth is. And I tell my children all the time, don't treat, you know, our senior population, or your grandparents, like you want to be treated. Treat them how they want to be treated. So it's a matter also of, you know, making sure we treat them how they deserve, how they want to be treated. And I don't think they just want to get on a, on a, a you know, the paratransit with no air conditioning, someone they can't communicate with and pay $6 to go there and back. Got it. Thank you. Um, we're going to have to wrap up shortly, but do you have any final thoughts you want to share, Veronica? Well, again, you know, thank you for the opportunity to speak um, to the Richmond Center and the Richmond Senior Center. Um, I live actually a couple blocks. My campaign office is a couple blocks away. So thank you for your work. I see you guys every day out there, you know, hustling and making sure everyone um, is fed in the community and everyone has the services. I think nonprofits like yourself uh, have really stepped up to the plate during COVID-19 where the city has um, not. So for that, thank you very much. For our senior population, again, you are the backbone of San Francisco. You are the backbone of our economy. If it wasn't for you, a lot of parents would not be able to work a full-time job because they would have to you know, worry about their children being picked up from school or after, after school childcare. You make sure our nonprofits are you know, moving forward because again, I say you are number one volunteers in our community. So thank you very much for you know, keeping us safe and moving our economies for so many years without people saying thank you. I know I value my parents um, a lot, even though it's quite challenging living with them, but I value also, you know, the experiences that, you know, our senior population brings. And I keep telling my parents, they come from a very tough, resilient generation. Um, and I can only hope to age um, like you all will and my parents have 
um, to be able to be, you know, strong in the head and healthy in the body and be able to continue, you know, walking up down these hills here on Gary Boulevard. So again, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Veronica. If you need to learn more about me, please email me, call me. I answer every phone call. I answer every email. So at veronicashinsato.com. Thanks, Veronica. I appreciate your time. And uh, we'll, it'll take an hour or so for the video recording to be like uploaded and processed. But when we've got it uploaded, I'll make sure it gets sent your way. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks. Take care.